our Bibles to Joshua chapter 8, and it's been a couple of weeks, so let's kind of review a little bit about where we've been and where we've, what's happened, because it kind of plays in here, and I, I, I want to I point out to you, uh, and I'll try to illustrate it the best I can, but there's this chapter, especially the beginning part of this chapter, has a lot of New Testament principles that came right out of Jesus' mouth. We just kind of got to find it, okay, or point it out. But anyway, okay, so the children of Israel crossed the Jordan River miraculously by the hand of God. He parted the river, and uh, and they walked across on dry land, and uh, they finally made it to the promised land, and they set up memorials, and they had this repentance going on, and they were bringing their lives back into obedience. They... Uh, The ones who hadn't been circumcised got circumcised to honor the covenant. And then they they observed the Passover first time in years. And and so then uh, they headed out to take Jericho. And they followed this uh, really crazy sounding plan that God had in spite of how crazy it sounded they followed it to the letter and God brought the victory and it was great but if you remember uh, Achan or Akan as the way it's pronounced in the Hebrew dictionary Akan uh, he stole some of the articles because God told them uh, God told them don't take any of the plunder for yourselves as far as the livestock lay it all to waste kill everything and uh, the people and the livestock kill it all and put the silver and the gold and the valuable things in the Lord's treasury. He calls them the accursed things because it's a curse for you to have, uh, but the Lord it goes in the Lord's treasury. And we talked about all that. And, uh, but unbeknownst to them, Achan or Akan, whichever you prefer, had stolen some of these things and hidden it under his tent. And so they went to take Ai next. In this chapter 7, the last chapter, they went to take Ai and uh, you can see the human nature in chapter 7. They got a little cocky, and, uh, and they even leaned on their own understanding a little bit. They said, I ah, don't trouble all the people. You remember this part? Don't trouble all the people. Just send about 3,000 men. It's going to be a breeze. Don't worry about it and all that stuff. And they got the rear ends handed to them because the Lord wasn't with them because there was sin in the camp. And if you remember, they boiled it down and found that it was Achan and uh, he, he had to die. Now, with all this death in these physical illustrations, uh, if you're not careful, you'll start to see God as some sort of a uh, murderer or something. Uh, but that, but that, that, this covenant, it's, 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 it's about the law, and the law didn't make any bones about it. The wages of sin is death, and death is what happens when, you know, and all that stuff. But it helps me if we look at Israel, the nation of Israel, what I believe, or at least it helps me to look at it this way, is God's perspective. And what he sees, and we saw it back in chapter in Numbers too, uh, the story about Balaam and Balak, when they looked over the mountain, and he said, uh, Behold who? Jacob. And so I believe when God looks at the nation of Israel, he sees Jacob, the grandson of Abraham, his friend, to whom he made promises to, to, to provide the land and to make them a nation so that he could bring about Jesus to be Messiah and save the world. All this is unfolding as we go through time in history here. But anyway, so let's get started. Do you remember how chapter 7 started? And it said that, uh, well, let's just look at it. I don't want to quote it wrong. But it said, but the children of Israel committed, this is chapter 7, verse 1, but the children of Israel committed a trespass regarding the accursed things. For Achan, or Achan, the son of Carmi, the son of Zabdi, the son of Zerah, of the tribe of Judah, took of the accursed things. So the anger of the Lord burned against the children of Israel. That's how we started the last chapter. And we know that uh, when they went to Ai, that uh, they, they got beat pretty bad. I want you to notice the difference after the sin's been dealt with and after they repented and brought it back into obedience to God. It starts off in chapter 8, verse 1. Now the Lord said to Joshua, 
Do not be afraid, nor be dismayed. Take all the people of war with you. Very different from, you know, Proverbs chapter 3 says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart and don't lean on your own understanding. I believe what they were doing in the last chapter was leaning on their own understanding. Just take about 3,000, we'll wipe this out and come on back home and have some lamb chops for dinner, right? But the Lord has a very different plan in mind. I want you to watch it unfold. Now the Lord said to Joshua, do not be afraid. He said that before, nor be dismayed. He said that before, be strong and courageous. Take all the people of war with you and arise, go up to Ai. See, I have given it into your hand, the king of Ai, his people, his city, and his land. Verse 2, And you shall do to Ai and its king as you did to Jericho and its king. Now let's check this out. This is what I want you to see, the difference. Only its spoil and its cattle you shall take as booty for yourselves. Lay an ambush for the city behind it. Now he said when they were taking Jericho, don't take any of the stuff. It belongs to the Lord, right? And so I think there's a New Testament principle that's being laid out here because here in this, it says, it's spoil and cattle you take as booty for yourselves. You can have it all. And I'm reminded of Jesus in Matthew chapter 6, verse 33, when he said, seek first the, his kingdom and his righteousness and all these things will be added to you as well. The principle is right there. Let the Lord have his part first. And then he will give you everything that you need. The Lord first. And then everything we need will be added. I've seen that work out and to fruition in my life. Anybody else seen that work out? I live a lot better on 90% than I ever did on 100 uh, than I ever did on 100 plus a little illegal activity to supplement the income in the past, right? Live a lot better on the 90% because the Lord, is when we do it and we cooperate with the Lord, when we obey the Lord, we walk in faith and walk in obedience, He blesses us abundantly. So chapter, uh, verse 3. So Joshua arose and all the people of war to go up against Ai, and Joshua chose 30,000 mighty men of valor and sent them away by night. Okay, so what they did is tried to uh, use the tent <laughs> for themselves, right? Are you seeing that? 3,000 they sent before, now it's 30,000. And so the Lord's plan is, do you, I don't know how to explain what I'm thinking here. Do you see that? They're trying to use a tenth of what the Lord had in mind. That's leaning on your own understanding. That's insufficient. That's not going to work. But the Lord has got this elaborate battle plan that's going to be very effective. So let's just keep on going so I don't confuse myself even further. So Joshua arose and all the people of war to go up against Ai. And Joshua chose 30,000 mighty men of valor and sent them away by night. Verse 4. And he commanded them saying, Behold, you shall lie in ambush against the city behind the city. Do not go very far from the city, but all of you be ready. Verse 5. Then I and all the people who are with me will approach the city and it will come about when they come out against us, as at the first, that we shall flee before them. Uh, verse 6. For they will come out after us till we have drawn them from the city. For they'll say, they're fleeing from before us as at the first. Therefore we will flee before them. Then you shall rise from the ambush and seize the city. For the Lord your God will deliver it into your hand. Verse 8. And it will be when you have taken the city that you shall set the city on fire. According to the commandment of the Lord you shall do. See, uh, I have commanded you. Uh, this is Hebrew, and what Brian, where Brian was, was Greek. Uh, but the meaning of this expression, see, is the same. It's understand. I've commanded you. My command is for the Lord. I want you to understand this, discern this, that this is the way the Lord wants you to go about this. Okay, so verse 9. Joshua therefore sent them out, and they went to lie in ambush and stayed between Bethel and 
and Ai on the west side of Ai, but Joshua lodged that night among the people. I think it's interesting uh, that they're setting up to take the city. Okay, it's right between Bethel and Ai. Now, Bethel means house of God. That's what the word means. Ai means pile of ruins. And it's been, we talked about Jericho. The Lord said that Jericho was set apart and doomed for destruction. And I believe that Ai was set apart and doomed for destruction for centuries before they ever got here and actually made it a heap of ruins. Uh, actually, because if you go back to Genesis chapter 12, I think it's, it's either verse 6 or 16 or something like that. Before Abraham even had his name changed, God sent Abram out. And he was going forth, and he got to the place, you can read it for yourself, Genesis chapter 12. He got to the place at the foot of the mountain between Bethel and Ai. And that's where God told him, look, everywhere that you set your foot, I'm going to give you this land. It happened right here. And I think it's phenomenal that here we are. Uh, that, 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 that it was called Ai then too because Genesis chapter 12 says it was between Bethel and Ai, okay? And Ai means pile of ruins. And so I think it was set apart from that way back then and now here it is about to unfold. I think it's uncanny that way back then God promised Abraham right here in this historical geographical spot I'm going to give you all this land. And then soon after that, he changed his name from Abram uh, to Abraham, father of many nations. I, I think it's just uncanny that it happened this way. And so here we are now today, several centuries later, and he promised the land. And here we are taking it. Uh, and the, the faithfulness of God is just screaming at us here as we go back through this historical account. Okay. Verse 10, and Joshua rose up early in the morning and mustered the people and went up, he and the elders of Israel, before the people to Ai. And all the people of war who were with him went up and drew near, and they came before the city and camped on the north side of Ai. Now a valley lay between them and Ai. So he took about 5,000 men and set them in ambush between Bethel and Ai on the west side of the city. Verse 13, and, then, and when he, they had set the people, all the army that was on the north of the city and its rear guard on the west of the city, Joshua went that night into the midst of the valley. Okay, so the Lord said, send all the men of war. There were 30,000 total. We went to Ai, we advanced on Ai, there's 30,000 total, and they're coming in at the north. And you heard the battle plan, we're going to lay an ambush from behind the city. So 5,000 of these he sends off to the west side of the city, that's actually behind it, and then the rest of them are camping out in this valley to stay out of the sight at night, uh, waiting for the next morning. Okay, and so the, the remainder of them, well, let's just read on. I need to calm down a little bit. I'm getting, I, got, I, got, I, got, I got worked up. <laughs> Verse 13, And when they had set the people, all the army that was on the north of the city, and its rear guard, that's the 5,000, uh, on the west side of the city, Joshua went that night into the midst of the valley. Verse 14, Now it happened when the king of Ai saw it, that the men of the city hurried and rose early and went out against Israel to battle. He and all his people at an appointed place place before the plain, but he did not know that there was an ambush against him behind the city. And Joshua and all Israel made as if they were beaten before them and fled by the way of the wilderness. So all the people who were in Ai were called together to pursue them, and they pursued Joshua and were drawn away from the city. There was not a man left in Ai or Bethel who did not go out after Israel, so they left the city open and pursued Israel. Who's leaning on their own understanding now, right? When the favor of the Lord is back on Jacob, and when the Lord's plan is being worked out in Israel, 
then it baffles the minds of those who would come against the people of God. Don't you see that? Do you see that? Can you see it? It baffles her. So they're, they, they look down now. Israel was a little cocky last time, but they've repented and they've come back into faith and obedience to the Lord. And now Ai and Bethel, these men, they're a little cocky. And so they think, well, here they are in front of us. And so let's go get them because they're going to run away from us like they did before, right? And that happened. But the Lord had a different thing in mind, right? Okay, so then the Lord said to Joshua, Stretch out the spear that is in your hand toward Ai, for I will give it into your hand. And Joshua stretched out, wait a minute, wait a minute, I'm totally, I totally missed something. I want to back it back up to between Bethel and Ai. That's where God made the promise to Abram. That's where the promise was made. This is where we're setting up to take the victory as we are taking the land in the name of the Lord, right? But there's a principle here that I want us to walk away from here tonight uh, and understand. And that's that each and every day of our lives, this is a physical illustration of a spiritual truth. He, uh, Abram found himself between Bethel, the house of God, and a pile of ruins. And he had a choice to make. Israel now finds themselves between physical illustrations of spiritual principles. You on the page with me? Israel has now found themselves between Bethel, the house of God, and Ai, a pile of ruins. And you and I, as we walk this life out in discipleship, following Jesus, each and every day we're going to have choices of some kind coming at us from the world. We are in the valley between Bethel, the house of God, and Ai, a pile of ruins. And we have a choice to make. And that choice we have to make repeatedly and intentionally. And we have to make it with all of our heart with sincerity and honesty. Does everybody agree with that? We, the people of God, find ourselves where they did. Between the house of God and a pile of ruins. And we have a choice to make. That's why we need the Holy Spirit, the helper guiding us each and every day. That's why we don't need to try to drift away from the Lord. We need to be sure that we are intent in our faith, in our relationship with the Lord. Right? Amen? Okay, I just wanted to catch that. Uh, so the, uh, verse 18. Then the Lord said to Joshua, Stretch out the spear that is in your hand toward Ai, for I will give it into your hand. And Joshua stretched out the spear that was in his hand toward the city. It reminds me of Moses at the Red Sea, remember? And he had to stretch out the staff and the sea parted. And where was another time when the battle was going on? Who was that with? I don't remember. It's just coming to my head right now and I didn't research it out. When Moses held, had to hold the staff, the standard up and his arms got weak and every time he'd start dropping them down then they would start losing and so was it Joshua and Caleb that came alongside him and held his arms up so that the battle of the Lord Israel could win the battle and, and now here we are again I think it's symbolic uh, I, I think it's just a matter of yes I trust you Lord I'm going to do what you say and stretched out his spear toward Ai the Lord said stretch it out it's in your hand I'll give it in your hand and Joshua stretched out the spear that was in his hand toward the city so those in ambush arose quickly out of their place they ran as soon as he had stretched out his hand that's the signal right let the guys of the 5,000 come in here and wreck the city because they've drawn them out okay uh, and they, they as soon as he stretched his hand out they entered the city they took it and they hurried to set the city on fire verse 20 and when the men of Ai looked behind them, they saw, and behold, the smoke of the city ascended to heaven. So they had no power to flee this way or that way, and the people who had fled to the wilderness turned back on the pursuers. And so they got out here in front of them, and they're like, na 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 boo boo na 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 you know. And the people of Ai and Bethel came out. They turned and ran toward the wilderness, drew them out of town. The 5,000 came in, set the city on fire, took the cattle and all the stuff and all the valuables and the money uh, and killed all the people. They took the city and set it on fire and the smoke ascended into the sky. 
Uh, where did I leave off? 21? Now when uh, Joshua and all Israel saw that the ambush had taken the city and that the smoke of the city ascended, they turned back and struck down the men of Ai. Then the others came out of the, of the city against them, so they were caught in the midst of Israel, some on this side and some on that side. And they struck them down so that let none of them remain or escape. But the king of Ai they took alive and brought him to Joshua. So they drew him out. They chased them all out there. The 5,000 came in, burned the city, took all the stuff. And then they, after they set the city on fire, they came out. And then the men of Ai and Bethel were uh, out here, and they were trapped between them. So Joshua and these guys came back. The other guys came up. We got you. You're, you're, you're checkmate right here. And, and they won, and they beat, they, they, they beat them, and they beat them bad. Uh, and they turned the city, Ai, into its namesake, a pile of ruins. I'm reminded in, I think it's Revelation chapter 12, where uh, it says that the kingdoms of this world have become the kingdom of God and of his Christ. I think this is an illustration of that as they're taking these cities and as they're defeating the enemies, the, the kingdoms of the world are becoming. It began all the way on the other side of the Jordan River with Og of Bashan and Sihon, king of the Amorites. It began there. When the kingdoms of this world were being gathered up and becoming the kingdom of God and of his Christ, which of his Christ is coming many years later. We know that, but right, you see this is what's happening. So they got Jericho, now they've gotten Ai, and it's just going to advance on into the promised land. So they brought the king of Ai, they took him alive and brought him to Joshua. And it came to pass when Israel had made an end of slaying all the inhabitants of Ai in the field, in the wilderness where they pursued them, and when they had all fallen by the edge of the sword until they were consumed, that all, Israel, all the Israelites returned to Ai and struck it with the edge of the sword. So it was that all who fell that day, both men and women, were 12,000, all the people of Ai. It was not a very big city. Verse 26, for Joshua did not draw back his hand with which he stretched out the spear until he had utterly destroyed all the inhabitants of Ai. Only the livestock and the spoil of that city Israel took as booty for themselves according to the word of the Lord which he had commanded Joshua. So Joshua burned Ai and made it a heap forever, a desolation to this day. And the king of Ai, he hanged on a tree until even. And I'm sure there's some significance here in this, but I don't know what it is, so I'm not going to guess at it. And the king of Ai, he hanged on a tree until evening, and as soon as the sun was down, Joshua commanded that they should take his corpse down from the tree, because in the law, he had to, cast it at the entrance of the gate of the city and raise over it a great heap of stones that remains to this day. Now, so they got beat the first time, but they repented and brought it back into obedience, and they followed the Lord's plan instead of their own, and they've, had the, they've been given the victory over Ai like they were given the victory over Jericho. All kinds of principles that we've looked at as we've traveled through here. But now we've got Jericho and Ai under our belt here. And the Lord's given them the land. And so I want you to notice what we're going to do next. Now Joshua, verse 30, built an altar to the Lord God of Israel in Mount Ebal. As Moses, the servant of the Lord, had commanded the children of Israel. As it is written in the book of the law of Moses. That's Deuteronomy chapter 27. We covered that. An altar of whole stones over which no man has wielded an iron tool. And they offered on it burnt offerings to the Lord and sacrificed peace offerings. And there in the presence of the children of Israel, 
He wrote on the stones a copy of the law of Moses, which he had written. Do you remember when we traveled through the book of Deuteronomy and Moses had said, when you cross in, you know, uh, I want you to go to Ebal and Gerizim. I want you to over here at the foot of Ebal, I want you to build an altar and set up two stones that no man has ever touched and write the whole law on those stones. Remember that? Whitewash them and write the law on it. Now Joshua, as they're moving in obedience, is going to do this. And they're going to have some of the people on Ebal and some of the people on Gerizim. And we talked about that pretty much in detail. They're going to go up. They're going to see the law. Joshua's going to read it to them. All the people and the foreigners that are in the, in the, in the nation of Israel with them. Everybody is going to hear it. Joshua's going to read the law. He's going to write it on those great big stones. They're going to confront the law. They're going to realize if they look at it honestly, there's no way I can do it. I can't attain the righteousness that God requires by looking at this. But there's an altar there to which the Levites are going to offer sacrifices for peace offerings and burnt offerings for sin and peace offerings to celebrate. They're going to worship the Lord for the victories that He has given them. But it's a picture, you see, the spiritual principle that we make our own each and every day if we're being honest with ourselves, that when we step up to that mountain of death, Ebal, you know, it was a desolate place, and we're confronted by these huge stones, and the, le the book of Deuteronomy is written on there for us to see all the commandments of Moses, and we've guilty consciences look at this, and we're like, man, there's no way, but here's an altar to which we can offer burnt offerings for our sin, peace offerings to worship the Lord for His goodness, for His grace. And then when we turn from that law, being forgiven by Jesus, then we see Gerizim. It's a picture of life. It's a beautiful, green, plush mountain. We see life. Over here we saw death. We saw the law. But we also saw the altar. And then we saw Gerizim. And it's a wonderful illustration of Jesus and his forgiveness and his grace and the sacrifice that he made for us. But I think that it's remarkable that immediately after the taking of Jericho and Ai, even though Akan, the troubler, rose up and caused some problems, the Lord's faithfulness and the Lord's love and the Lord's mercy was with them and gave them the victory. And immediately Joshua went about obediently doing what Moses had commanded him of what the Lord told him to do. And I think that's just remarkable. And so anyway, we'll, we'll finish this up. And they offered on it burnt offerings to the Lord and sacrificed peace offerings. And there... In the presence of the children of Israel, he wrote on the stones a copy of the law of Moses which he had written. And then all Israel with their elders and officers and judges stood on either side of the ark before the priests, the Levites who bore the ark of the covenant of the Lord, the stranger as well as he who was born among them. Half of them were in front of Mount Gerizim and half of them in front of Mount Ebal as Moses the servant of the Lord had commanded before, that they should bless the people of Israel. And afterward he read all the words of the law, the blessings and the curses, according to all that is written in the book of the law. Do you remember how that went? That they had certain tribes go up on Gerizim and certain tribes on Ebal, and the ones up on Ebal, would, the priests would shout out, uh, uh, blessings, all the blessings that are in the law from Gerizim and the, the, the people in the valley would say, Amen! Amen! And the, guy, the, the guys that were up on Ebal, would, the picture of death, would shout out the curses that are in the law and, 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 they, and they would say, Amen! Amen! And Joshua is making this happen, walking in obedience to the law and in this covenant. And I think that's just remarkable. 
Verse 35, and we'll finish up. There was not a word of all that Moses had commanded, which Joshua did not read before all the assembly of Israel with the women, the little ones, and the strangers who were living among them. I know this was a different covenant. And I know the law was a, a totally different thing. But the principle is, was there then, and the principle is still here now, that we need to be hearing and reading and studying and applying the Word of God. We need to be studying the Word of God. We need to be in this Old Testament finding the pictures of Jesus, finding the illustrations of what was to come, of the greater and the better covenant, of the grace of God, of how He loves His people, and how He has brought them through time and history as this redemption plan has been unfolding. And how wonderful is it to have this place on this side of the cross enjoying the salvation that these pioneers trudged through death and all kinds of stuff. And the physical illustration, the sufferings and stuff and the things and the mistakes and all the stuff, the bumbling that Israel did. How wonderful is it that God had that recorded in this Bible honestly and truthfully, not leaving anything out for us to see and learn from and grow from and understand. I just think that that's remarkable. Of what a God, what a mighty, mighty God we serve. Maybe I should have closed with that song, but I didn't. I think that when they made it back to Ebal and Gerizim, the reason I chose the song I chose is because I think that if they were truly giving God the glory and the credit that he deserves, I think that that would be a memorable day for them. And I think they could probably sing this closing song with us. I never shall forget the day. There certainly was there. How, how wonderful is it that we have this Bible? That we can look and discover the history of God's people. And God's